Welcome back to this special edition of Cattlemen to Cattlemen. As we talk with a group of experts about the relationship between corn and cattle. You know, we've talked a lot about corn and corn byproducts, and uh, Galen, I'd like to begin with you. Tell us about the nutritional differences between corn itself and distiller's grains. Yeah, we've, we've learned a lot about use of distiller's grains, even though it's not a new feed, because we've been feeding a lot from whiskey plants for hundreds of years, but uh, what, there's a lot of new things that are happening today. But a lot of beef producers, I think, are surprised that you can take corn take out the starch, which is what we've been used to feeding it for from an energy standpoint to make it into ethanol, and yet get a feed out that's, that's uh, good for the cattle. So we've done a lot of research, and in fact, I have a mentor and colleague, Terry Klofenstein at the University of Nebraska, who's been around for 60 years doing research. He says the biggest thing he's seen that's changed at least Nebraska's beef industry in his career. And so, uh, We've, we've done a lot of research, a lot of producers are feeding distillers. In fact, I would argue almost all here in the state of Nebraska. And uh, it's an excellent feed. You know, we, we look at it as, uh, as a protein source, works great. In fact, it has the right kind of protein for, for younger, lighter background in cattle, because it's high in what we call bypass protein. And we think it's by far the most economical source of that type of protein if you need that in your operation. But on the feedlot side in the feed yard sector, it has more energy than corn that you're replacing. So we've looked at titrating levels and, and you know, we think that if it's priced competitive to corn, frankly, you're foolish at your operation not to be feeding at least 20, 30%. And that's on a dry basis. So if you're feeding wet distiller's grains, that might be half or more of your diet on an as-is basis. But it all depends on the price competitiveness, which is varied over time. Uh, but we certainly know how it feeds and we know what its energy values are and done a lot of testing with it. And there's a new generation of DDGs, is that right, Kylie? Yeah, so uh, the benefits of those, like he mentioned, was um, there's lots of proteins, the minerals, and it's good for um, the feed yards. Um, a lot of there is wet and there is dry. Um, the dry does have a longer shelf life. The wet goes to um, the feedlots. Yeah, so the corn uh, fractionation process uh -huh. in these ethanol plants has really changed since the beginning of the plant starting, you know, starting and opening up. Um, you were coming a lot more, you know, we've had wet cake and, and that stuff for uh, for years and wet distillers, but um, now we're, you know, taking more of that, uh, that oil out and that's being sent either to biodiesel or, uh, or also back into other feed rations. And then you're looking at uh, uh, the germ also being taken out. So you've got different, you know, different value streams for the ethanol plants, uh, but all those can come back into higher quality feed products when you, you know, you separate those out and go into different industries as well. So again, our resident nutritionist, tell us about some of the benefits of these next generation DDG feed products. Well, I think as, as, as Kevin and them have discussed, the oil taken out was kind of the first step. Okay. And that's, that's only removing part of the oil. And, um, and our data would have suggested that wet distiller's grains had about 125 to 140% the energy of corn. When we take out some of the oil, um, we actually decrease that value by about 8%. So it doesn't make it into corn, let's say, but it does have a small depression in the energy value. And I think then feed yards have adopted and adapted to that by knowing their source. Some of these next generation ones are even a little more complicated uh, processes. I think beef producers uh, never thought they'd become distillers, grains, or ethanol plant experts. But to be honest, you're going to have to. You'll have to know what is your source, what process are they using. But we've been testing them as they get developed, and, and I think we'll learn more and more as the years come. I would point out that they're, they're certainly exciting for the ethanol industry to have a high protein dry distiller's grains. That increases market opportunities for them, and, and we can't begrudge that. Uh, but there'll always be some good stuff left for the beef cattle producers, and, um, and we obviously want to utilize those fibrous uh, products that are, that are kind of the left after some of those higher value products come out in the, in the high protein distillers grain. So it'll be, if it's been confusing for beef producers in the last 15 years, uh, uh, hold on, but I think it, you know, with the right kind of knowledge and understanding your source, we can adapt. I think the guys that run, you know, the feed yard though, they've been used to adjusting rations for years. You know, I mean, you you go and take what uh, what's going to be the most efficient and what's going to be the best price product, and you adjust the rations to that. So this isn't anything new for the guys that run a feed yard. It's just adjusting to where it's coming from and knowing what product you're getting. 
You're exactly right, Kevin. And then with, with all the things that we have to adjust for, you look at cost, you know, and, and yes, we feed these products, but if they're a higher cost, then you actually have to change that ration that, you know, again, we're trying to do it to try to make money. And, and that's the main thing about this. And margins are tight. Margins are tight in the corn industry. Those same margins are tight in, in the beef industry. So we use all these things to try to maximize those benefits. And there's a lot of research going on around this topic. I guess, Galen, I'd ask you, uh, what is the research telling us in terms of uh, feed intake and performance on some of these new DDG products? Well, for the next generation ones, we've worked with a couple of what we think are the leading uh, process manufacturers. And some of those have been adopted in plants in Nebraska and other states, but it's not real common yet, but there's a few plants operating today. And uh, I think that when we look at some of those fiber that's mixed with the solubles or the syrup that's also in those plants, we saw surprisingly close performance to feeding regular distiller's grains. Now they're going to continue to change that a little bit and we're, we're doing some cutting edge things or new things on, on evaluating that. but. Uh, so far, it looks fine with all of the products that are being produced, that it's still an excellent cattle feed. As Mike alluded to, you know, that, that may require some adjustments depending upon how prices are, but I, I think we'll adapt and it still looks positive compar in comparison to corn. We've tested a lot of the dry versus wet versus modified, which are kind of partially dried here in the state of Nebraska, because really we have all three. Uh, Mike's in a location where he's blessed to have really wet or modified, and, and we do see that, that by drying it, it, it takes a little bit of value out of it for the cattle, but that's necessary if you don't have a lot of cattle right next to you, and you can ship it further. It does increase shelf life, and it's still an excellent protein supplement, especially in, in forage-fed cattle. So there's a whole lot of, you know, this is a segment in its own on how to use distiller's grains the best and what's coming. So it's a... Uh, it's a complicated issue, but uh, we're all wising up, and I think we've learned a lot in the last 20 years. We'll just have to keep learning the next 20. Well, so, so look ahead. I mean, what are those new frontiers we're exploring in terms of the net new avenues to look at uh, relative to the efficiency of using corn and feeding cattle? Well, we've been looking at what does this do to the sustainability picture, so doing some life cycle analyses, and as you change the process, that influences that life cycle assessment. We've also been looking at where is it most optimized. And so, as I mentioned, if it's truly a protein supplement, we think that optimization's probably in growing forage fed backgrounding type cattle. In many cases, even cattle out on range, but a lot of our cow calf producers across the country like feeding distiller's grains, uh, especially in the winter time as a protein supplement. It's always been probably the most palatable feed you can supplement to cattle. Uh, we've joked that if you really want your cattle to come up and check them, start supplementing some distiller's grains, you gotta, some people have to worry about running over them because they get in front of the wagon. It, it's a palatable feed once they get on it. It's great for receiving cattle. It's great for in, into a feed yard. Uh, it in, we're looking at how does it interact with other ingredients. So how does it fit with Mike's operation where he's feeding high moisture corn? How does it fit with operations using dry corn? How does it fit some of our larger yards that are flaking? Or in the south? So there's a whole lot of interactions and things we like to test on the use of distiller's grains and we expect more of that in the future. Very good, very fascinating. Have you seen some uh, some experiences right here at the uh, the yard that you'd share with us? <laughs> well, there's change every day. It seems sure. like, and especially here in the last couple of years, you know, in, in Nebraska where we had the floods and we couldn't get the distillers grains, you have drought issues and things like that, and so. You know, you have to adjust with whatever we have, and that's where the university's been a tremendous asset to us, that they've had all these studies, you know, if you have to feed more roughage or you're trying to find roughage products. And so, you know, we adapt with all the farmers in this area. Again, you know, you look at different things and, and we use corn oil to try to yeah. bring that back in. Again, that's gotta be on a cost. Does it, is it pay to use that? So all these things, you know, we definitely, we change our rations a lot, but they're micro changes because the more, the biggest, that's what you try to keep away from is making large changes within that. And so the, our supply of these products and things like that of the corn and the byproducts have to be a consistent supply because if you lose that and, you, and you're jumping around on your rations, that's what really hurts the performance on the cattle. Performance and health with cattle. Exactly. Very good, fascinating discussion. 
Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, what are resources available to producers who want to improve their sustainability? We'll have insights on that question when we return.